Hi, I'm John Mark Tomlinson. I'm an anaesthetic specialist working at Harry Gwyler Regional Hospital in Peter Maritzburg. One of the roles I have here is working as the obstetric lead and trying to improve our anaesthetic service delivery in the obstetric context. Obstetric airway management carries a high risk of both difficult and failed intubation. In a 2015 paper by Kinsella et al. in IJOA, the rate of failed intubation in general anesthesia for caesarean deliveries stood at 0.2%, largely unchanged for decades. The number I want to focus on is 1 in 6. Between 2017 and 2019, we collected data on the incidence of hypoxemia during induction of general anesthesia for caesarean deliveries at two KZN hospitals. This was published in Sarja in 2020. Our finding, after recruiting 363 patients, was that 17%, or 1 in 6 patients, desaturated to below 90% during their intubation. An excellent study by Smit et al. from UCT, published in IJOA in 2021, looked at hypoxemia during tracheal intubation in patients with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Their findings, after looking at 402 patients, showed a similar incidence of 19% in the hypertensive group versus 9% in the non-hypertensive group. Interestingly, both of these local studies identified high BMI as a significant risk factor. Today, I want to propose an obstetric airway bundle to you. This bundle is based on a similar premise to other bundles of care, such as ERAS. The idea being that individually, various interventions may not bring about significant changes in outcomes. However, when bundled together, significant improvements can be achieved. In a sense, 1 plus 1 equals 3. The interventions that I'm proposing today can be div divided into four specific actions that can be employed to maximize successful airway management during general anesthesia for caesarean delivery. These are patient positioning, pre-oxygenation and apneic oxygenation, amendments to the classically employed rapid sequence induction, and finally, routine confident use of video laryngoscopy. So for the next 10 minutes, we'll have a look at these four interventions and how they contribute to improve success when managing the obstetric airway. First up is patient positioning. The specific intervention is ramping of the patient at a 20 to 30 degree head up position. This can be achieved by aligning the external auditory meatus with the suprasternal notch. There are two main benefits to this position. The first is improved pre-oxygenation by increasing the functional residual capacity. This is well supported by physiological principles. As the patient is ramped, there's less upward displacement of the diaphragm by the gravid abdomen. This in turn increases the functional residual capacity, and this increased functional residual capacity allows for improved pre-oxygenation and a prolonged apnea to desaturation time. The second benefit is improved laryngoscopy. It is easier to insert the laryngoscope with less interference of breast tissue, and there's also improved um, views of the airway as the axes align better in this position. One last thing to think about here is a theoretical reduction in the risk of regurgitation. This is simply because as the head is now above the stomach, just by virtue of gravity, there is a reduced risk of passive regurgitation and aspiration. The next thing we're going to look at is pre-oxygenation and apneic oxygenation. And there's four things that I'm going to speak about here. The first is pre-oxygenation with a tight-fitting mask at 10 liters a minute, aiming for an end tidal oxygen of 90%. This is a simple intervention with equipment that should be available at all settings and all uh, resourced facilities. The important thing here is that what we're trying to achieve is good pre-oxygenation and then post-induction a prolonged apnea to desaturation time, 
The idea here is that if one has a patent airway and we're running flows of 10 liters a minute or more, there is bulk flow of oxygen, which allows for continual oxygenation through the apneic period. A similar principle to this is using nasal prong oxygen. Again, a simple intervention that all resource settings should have available to them. Here, nasal prongs are, are placed on the patient prior to induction, and post-induction, flows are increased to 5 liters a minute. My suggestion is that you use both of these interventions routinely. They will improve your pre-oxygenation, and they will also improve your apneic oxygenation, allowing for a longer time before desaturation. The fancier options available in possibly higher resource hospitals are nasopharyngeal catheters. What these are are essentially nasopharyngeal airways which have an oxygen port attached to them. The benefit of this is that you don't necessarily have to maintain a patent airway because it bypasses the pharynx and it, it supplies oxygen just above the cords in the, in the hyperpharynx. This allows for continual oxygenation uh, uh, while the patient is apneic uh, without, without requiring you to do any maneuvers to maintain a patent airway. Finally, high flow nasal oxygen therapy. I think that this is probably the future of difficult airways in the obstetric setting, but we just don't have the evidence yet. There was, however, a study published by Zhao et al. in 2021, which looked at using high-flow nasal oxygen during rapid-sequence inductions in pregnancy. They found a statistical significance uh, in terms of the increased PaO2, but there was no difference in the lowest stats achieved between routine pre-oxygenation and using high-flow nasal oxygen. However, there is a study currently being conducted in Sweden with results expected in 2022, also looking at the use of high-flow nasal oxygen in the obstetric population, and it will be interesting to see what they find here. My suggestion would be that if you identify a high-risk airway, a patient who you expect difficult laryngoscopy or intubation, or is at risk of rapid desaturation, high-flow nasal oxygen is certainly something you could employ. Next, we're going to look at the rapid sequence induction, or possibly the modified rapid sequence induction that we should be using in our obstetric patients. The first thing we're going to talk about is cricoid pressure. If one looks at the Difficult Airway Society guidelines from 2015, it's still suggested to use cricoid pressure routinely. However, it's well understood that there are risks and benefits to this intervention. The benefits are obviously a reduced risk of regurgitation and aspiration. And also, there's reduced insufflation of the stomach if you're going to mask ventilate the patient. This was actually the reason why cricoid pressure was initially employed. The risks, unfortunately, are that it can impair your view at laryngoscopy, it can make passing a tube more difficult, and it can make placement of a supraglottic airway device more difficult. So the suggestion here is that use cricoid pressure routinely but you can have a low threshold to release it if you are running into any trouble. The second thing to consider is should you be mask ventilating your patients? And my suggestion is that all caesarean sections or general anesthetics for caesarean sections should be mask ventilated. Again, the 2015 DAS guidelines say to strongly consider it, but I think that seven years later, we've got to a point where it should be routine. If one looks at the suggested patients who would benefit from mask ventilation during rapid sequence induction, it includes those with poor respiratory reserve, those with a high metabolic rate, and those with sepsis. I think we can all agree that our obstetric patients all have poor respiratory reserves and high metabolic rates. And given that sepsis is the number one killer of our pregnant ladies in South Africa, you may have a full house. How to do it? It's called gentle mask ventilation or gentilation. So pressures of less than 20 centimeters of water with cricoid pressure to lower the risk of gastric insufflation. And again, my suggestion is that this should become routine. Next, we'll look at traditional laryngoscopy versus video laryngoscopy. This is a difficult one in the South African context because video lar laryngoscopes are not always available so you have to be comfortable using either of these 
for your intubations. My suggestion would be to learn traditional laryngoscopy first, and once you're comfortable with traditional laryngoscopy, become comfortable with video laryngoscopy. I think video lar laryngoscopes are an incredibly good teaching tool, and so if you are in a hospital or you're in a position where you're teaching junior doctors how to intubate, I think for your for your Caesars, what you should be doing is allowing them to use the video laryngoscope, but they use it as a direct laryngoscope looking into the patient for the intubation while you're watching on the screen and teaching them. Once or out of that context and when you are just deciding what is your technique that you're going to use, my suggestion is you have to be comfortable with both. You need to be practiced with both. I think it's acceptable to use a traditional laryngoscope for for low risk or if, you, if you've not identified any risk factors. But for any patient who you think will be a difficult laryngoscopy or potentially rapid desaturation, use your video laryngoscope as your primary device. Again, of course, you want your, your first attempt to be your best attempt. Interestingly, if you look at the, the DAS guidelines, they include video laryng uh, lar laryngoscopes as part of their routine airway equipment. So it's, it's not part of their, their difficult airways or predicted difficult airways, it's routine. And we should certainly be moving towards that. And my suggestion is that if your hospital has a video laryngoscope, it should live in the obstetric theater and it gets borrowed from there because that's the situation where you most like to, to need it at, in an emergency situation. Finally, just a word on endotracheal tubes versus supraglottic airway devices, specifically second generation supraglottic airway devices. A study released in 2018 by Fang et al. looked at using LMA Supremes in emergency seizures. It was a retrospective study that had over a thousand patients in it. The highlights are they had no aspirations or regurgitations. The supraglottic airway device was successfully placed in all but two cases and in, on the first attempt. And in those two cases, they were both successful on the second attempt. I don't think we're there yet. There's absolutely no doubt for me that a secure airway is an endotracheal tube in the obstetric population. But what I want you to take away from this is that if you are struggling with your laryngoscopy or intubation, you can confidently move on to using a second generation supraglottic airway device with this study, if nothing else, to just help create some calm when you're in that situation. So to conclude, my hope is that this airway bundle will will give you something to fall back on and maybe just help you to amend your technique in small ways that will save you one or two desaturations and just keep you out of trouble more often. My suggestions are all of your patients arrive and are ramped at 25 degrees, 20 to 30 degrees head up prior to embarking on your pre-oxygenation. Once you're satisfied with your patient position, you need to think about how you're going to pre-oxygenate them and how you're going to take advantage of apneic oxygenation, with the idea being to increase their apnea to desaturation time. I think for routine airways or where there's no uh, excess difficulty identified, my suggestion would be tight-fitting face mask, 10 liters a minute, with nasal prong oxygen, which is increased to five liters a minute post-induction, maintaining a patent airway so that you can get bulk flow of oxygen. If, however, you've identified any risk factors, you're worried about a difficult intubation or you're worried about a rapid desaturation for another reason, I think that high flow nasal oxygen therapy is going to become routine in the future for these patients. And I think we should keep an eye out for these studies that are coming out later this year. If you're lucky enough to have a nasopharyngeal catheter, I think this is an excellent adjunct to use routinely. Regarding the modified rapid sequence induction, cricoid pressure should be routine, but you can confidently have a low threshold to remove it if it's affecting your laryngoscopy or your ability to intubate or your ability to place a supraglottic airway device. At the same time, I think gentle face mask ventilation should be standard in all cesarean section patients. I think it answers three questions for you. Are you able to mask ventilate 
this is a good question to have answered if you run into trouble further down. It's nice to know that your bailout will be successful. The second reason is that it lowers your um, accidental anesthetic awareness risk because it allows you to get volatile into your patients. There's often a long delay between induction and starting your volatiles due to the difficulty of the airway. So this is something to certainly consider. And the third reason is that it just increases your apnea to desaturation time because you continue to oxygenate throughout. Finally, you've got to be comfortable using a video laryngoscope. And if you have identified any risks of a difficult intubation or a rapidly desaturating patient, I would suggest using video laryngoscopy as your standard tool to intubate these patients. My hope is that with these simple interventions and small changes in practice, that we can all improve our obstetric airway management and basically just have fewer of those hairy intubations that we've all experienced in the obstetric theater. Thanks so much.